Unit 5, Cognitive Psychology. <clears throat> oh, the glare from my window is horrible. Anyway. Throughout history, we humans have both bemoaned our foolishness and celebrated our wisdom. The poet T.S. Eliot was struck by the hollow men, headpiece filled with straw. But Shakespeare's Hamlet entold the human species as noble in reason, infinite in f faculties, in apprehension how like a god. In the preceding units, we have likewise marveled at both our abilities and our errors. Earlier in this text, we studied the human brain, three pounds of wet tissue the size of a small cabbage, yet containing circuitry more complex than the planet's telephone networks. We appreciated the amazing abilities of newborns. We mar marveled at our sensory system, translating visual stimuli into nerve impulses, distributing them for parallel processing, and reassembling them into colorful perceptions. Little wonder that our species has had the collective genius to invent the camera, the car, and the computer, to unlock the atom and crack the genetic code, to travel out to space and into our brain's depths. Yet we've also seen that our species is related to the other animals, influenced by the same principles that produce learning in rats and pigeons. We have noted that we not-so-wise humans are easily deceived by perceptual illusions, uh, pseudo-psychic claims, and hypnos in hypnosis-induced false memories. In this part, we encounter further instances of these two images of the human condition, the rational and the irrational. We will ponder our memory's enormous ca capacity and the ease with which our two-track mind processes information with and without our awareness. We will consider how we, will how we use and misuse the information we receive, perceive, store, and retrieve. We will look at our gift for language and consider how and why it develops. We will reflect on how deserving we are of our species' name, Homo sapiens, wise human. To be wise is to think clearly, reflecting on what we know. Psychologists call this metacognition. Meta means beyond or about. Thus, metacognition is cognition about cognition or knowing what we know. In psychology, it refers to an awareness of our thinking processes and an understanding of what we know. Students with greater metacognition can change their behavior to improve their learning. Module 31, Studying and Encoding Memories. Be thankful for memory. We take it for granted, except when it malfunctions. But it is our memory that accounts for time and defines our life. It is our memory that enables us to recognize family, speak our language, and find our way home. It is our memory that enables us to enjoy an experience and then mentally replay and enjoy it again. It was our memory that enables us to build his histories with those we love. And it is our memory that occasionally pits us against those who of offenses we cannot forget. Our shared memories help us help bind us together as Irish or Icelandic, Serbian or Simone. In large part, we are what we remember. Without memory, our storehouse of accumulated learning, there would be no savoring of past joys, no guilt or anger over painful recollections. We would instead live in an enduring present, each moment fresh, each person would be a stranger, every language foreign, every task, dressing, eating, biking, a new challenge. You would even be a stranger to yourself, lacking that continuous sense of self that extends your distant past and your mem momentary present. Okay. I got my outline here. So, memory helps shape our identity. Studying memory. Memory is learning that persists over time. It is information that has been acquired and stored and can be retrieved. Research on memory's extremes has helped us understand how memory works. At age 92, my, Diem's father, suffered a small stroke that had one, but one particular effect. He was as mobile as before. His general personality was intact. He knew us and enjoyed poring over family photo albums and res reminiscing about his past. But he had lost most of his ability to lay down new memories of conversations in everyday episodes. He could not tell me what day of the week it was or what he'd had for lunch. Told repeatedly of his brother-in-law's recent death, he was surprised and sad at each time he heard the, heard the loot news. Some disorders slowly strip away memory. Alzheimer's disease begins as difficulty remembering new information and progresses 
regresses into an inability to do everyday tasks. Family members and close friends become strangers. Complex speech devolves to simple sentences. The brain's memory centers weaken and wither. Over several years, someone with Alzheimer's might become unknowing and unknowable. Lost memory strikes at the core of our humanity, leaving people robbed of a sense of joy, meaning, and companionship. Without your memory, would you be you? At the other extreme are people who would win gold medals in a memory Olympics. Russian journalist Simon uh, Shurisheveki, or S, had merely begun to listen while other reporters scribbled notes. Had merely to listen while others scribbled notes. The average person could repeat back a string of about seven, maybe nine digits. S could repeat up to 70. If they were read about three seconds apart in an otherwise silent room, Moreover, he could recall digits or words backwards as easily as forward. His accuracy was uh, unnerving. Even when recalling a list 15 years later, yes, yes, he might recall. This was the series you gave me once when you were at your apartment. You were sitting at the table and I in the rocking chair. You were wearing a gray suit. Amazing, yes, but consider your own impressive memory. You remember countless faces, places, and happenings, tastes, smells, and textures, voices, sounds, and songs. In one study, students listened to snippets, a mere four-tenths of a second from popular songs. How often did they recognize the artist and song? More than 25% of the time. We often recognize songs as quickly as we recognize a familiar voice. So, too, with faces and places, imagine viewing more than 2,500 slides of faces and places for 10 seconds each. Later, you sued 280 of these slides paired with the others you'd never seen. Actual participants in this experiment recognized 90% of the slides they had viewed in the first round. In a follow-up experiment, people exposed to 2,800 images for only 3 seconds each spotted the repeats with 90, 82% accuracy. Look for a target face and a sea of faces, and you will later recognize the other faces from the scene as well. Some super recognizers display an extraordinary ability to recognize faces. 18 months after viewing a video of an armed robbery, one such police officer spotted and arrested the robber walking on a busy street. And it's not just humans who have shown remarkable rem memory for faces. Sheep can learn to remember faces, and so can at least one fish species, as demonstrated by the sp uh, spitting at familiar faces to trigger a food, for food reward. <clears throat> How do we humans accomplish such memory feats? How does our brain pluck information out of the world around us and tuck it away for later use? How can we remember things we have not thought about for years, yet forget the name of someone we just met? How are memories stored in our brain? Why will you be likely later in this module to misrecall the sentence, the angry rioter threw the rock out the window? In this and the next two modules, we'll consider these fascinating questions and more. Alzheimer's. I'm worried about that. Alzheimer's disease leads to the deterioration of memory. which can rob people oh, people 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 of their sense of Retention. Oh. To a psychologist, evidence that learning persists includes these three retention measures. Recall. Retrieving information that is not currently in your conscious awareness, but that was learned in an earlier time. A fill-in-the-blank question tests your recall. Re recognition. Identifying items previously learned. A multiple-choice question tests your recognition. Um... Relearning. Learning something more quickly when you learn it a second or later time. When you study for a final exam or engage a language you used in early childhood, you will relearn the material more easily than you did initially. Okay, let's write those down, actually. Recall is retrieving information.
learned at an earlier time. Um, recognition is identifying items previously worn relearning is learning something more quickly Seven point long after you cannot recall most of the people in your high school graduating class you may still be able to recognize their yearbook pictures and spot their names in a list of names in one experiment people who had graduated 25 years earlier could not recall many of their old classmates but they could recognize 90 percent of their pictures and names if you are mo like most students you too could probably recognize more names of snow white's seven dwarves than you could recall our recognition memory is impressively quick and vast is your friend wearing a new or old outfit old is it this five second movie clip from a film you've ever seen yes have you ever seen this person before this minor variation on the same old human features um no before the mouth can form our answer to any millions of such questions the mind knows and knows that it knows our response speed when recalling or recognizing information indicates memory strength as does our uh, does our speed at relearning pioneering memory researcher herman Eb ebbinghaus showed this over a century, ago, a century ago using nonsense syllables. He randomly selected a sample of syllables, practiced them, and tested himself. To get a feel for his experiments, rapidly read aloud eight times over the following list, then look away and try to recall the items. The day after learning such a list, Ebbing Haas could recall a few of the, sibble, a so, few of the sibble, syllables, but they weren't entirely forgotten. As figure this portrays, the more frequently he repeated the list aloud on day one, the less time he required to relearn the list on day two. Additional re rehearsal of verbal information can produce overlearning, which increases retention, especially when practice is distributed over time. Um, for students, this means that it helps to rehearse course material even after you know it. Point to remember, tests of recognition and of time spent relearning demonstrate what we remember more than we, we can recall. Okay, I'm going to write memory is much, um, actually, yeah, easier learned when rehearsed. That's spelled wrong, but whatever. Um, several times. S several times. I might read, whatever, yeah, sure. Memory models. Architects make virtual house models to help clients imagine their future homes. Similarly, psychologists create memory models that, even if imperfect, are useful. Such models help us think about how our brain forms and retrieves information. Memories, sorry. An information processing model likens human memory to computer operations. Thus, to remember any event, we must get information into our brain, a process called encoding, retain that information, a process called storage, later get the information back out, a process called retrieval. Like all analogies, computer, computer models have their limits. Our memories are less literal and more fragile than a computer's. Most computers also process information sequentially, even while alternating between tasks. Our agile brain processes 
many things simultaneously, some of them unconsciously, by means of parallel processing. To focus on the multi-track processing, one information processing model, co connectionism, views memories as products of interconnected neural networks. Specific memories arise from particular activity a activation patterns within these networks. Every time you learn something new, your brain's neural connections change, forming and strengthening pathways that allow you to interact with and learn from your constantly changing environment. To explain our memory forming process, Richard Atkinson and Richard, oh, they're both called Richard, Sturfin proposed a three-stage model. We first record to be remembered information as fleeting sensory memory. From there, we process information into short-term memory where we encode it through re rehearsal. Finally, information moves into long-term memory for later retrieval. This model has since been updated with important newer components, including working memory and automatic processing. That's a lot of things. One second. Sorry, I'm bleeding on my back right now. I was just checking to make sure it wasn't getting all over my shirt. It's almost done bleeding, so like whatever. Um, anyway. Um Getting information into your brain is called encoding, retaining it, retaining info is storage. Um, getting it back out, getting info back out is retrieval. We process things simultaneously. Oh, simultaneously. grammar doesn't need to be perfect. Parallel. Oh my god, I spelled it wrong. Parallel process. Um. So I'm just looking at some of the vocab parts because I'm going to need to memorize them later. Okay. Connectivism. Connectionism. Sorry. Connectionism. Views memories as products of inter. Neural networks. So, like, if you retrieve something, like a certain memory activates a bunch of things that are similar to it, I think is what that says. Anyway, Axon, okay, I should write their names. Axon, Atkinson, Atkinson, and Schifrin, 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 made the model. Um, sensory memory. Short term. Now in 
includes includes working and automatic processing. Cool. How many posters do I have? Left? Probably a lot. A significant amount. That's okay. Working memory. Alan Badenly and others extended Ak Atkinson's and Shurifin's initial view of short-term memory as a space for briefly restoring recent thoughts and experiments. The stage is not just a temporary shelf for holding incoming information. It's an active scratch pad where your brain actively processes information by making sense of new input and linking it with long-term memories. It also works in the opposite direction by processing already stored information, whether we hear ice Ice cream as ice cream or ice cream depends on how the context of our experience guides and our experience guides our interpreting and encoding of the sounds. To focus on the active processing that takes place in this middle stage, psychologists use the term working memory. Right now, are you, you are using your working memory to link the information you're reading with your previously stored information. Is there a second part of working memory? Yeah, let's just do this. For most of you, what you are reading enters working memory through vision. You might also repeat the information using auditory rehearsal. As you integrate these memories, memory inputs with your existing long-term memory, your attention is focused. Recall from Module 20 the mental spotlight that we call selective attention. Um, in Badley's model, a central executive coordinates this focused processing. Without focused attention, information often fades. If you think you can look something up later, you attend to it less and forget it more quickly. In one experiment, people read and type new bits of trivia they would later need, such as an ostrich's eye is bigger than its brain. If they knew the information would be available online, they invested less energy and remembered it less well. Online, out of mind. So... Working memory. Um, use stored long term and new information to process and Select what to pay attention to. Perfect. Okay. I have like no drink on. Uh, one sec, let me check my back again. Mm. Stopped bleeding. We're all good. Encoding memories. Atkinson and Shirifin's model focused on how we process our explicit memories, the facts and experiences that we can consciously know and declare. Uh, oh god, that's more vocab words. Anyway. The facts, uh, yeah, 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 also called declarative memories. We encode explicit memories through conscious effort, effortful processing, but our mind has a second unconscious track. Behind the scenes, other information skips the conscious encoding track and barges directly into storage. This automatic processing, which happens without our awareness, produces implicit memories, also called non-declarative memories. Our two-track mind, then, helps us encode, retain, and retrieve information through both effortful and automatic tracks. Let's begin by seeing how automatic processing assists the information of implicit information. So, formation, sorry. Anyway. Explicit memories. Explicit, yeah. Memories are conscious 
facts and experiences. That we know. Sure, that works. Um, effortful processing. Um, is uh, encoding. memory okay, and then automatic processing happens unconsciously and goes straight straight into storage creating implicit memories cool next page okay. automatic processing and implicit memories our implicit memories include procedural memory for automatic skills, such as how to ride a bike, and classically conditioned associations among stimuli. If attacked by a dog in childhood, years later you may, without recalling the conditions association, automatically tense up as the dog approaches. Without conscious effort, you may also automatically process information about space. While studying, you often encode the place on a, on a page or in your notebook where you, certain material appears. Later, when you want to retrieve the information, you may visualize its location. Time. When going about your day, you unintentionally note the sequence of, of its events. Later, realizing you left your backpack somewhere, the event sequence your brain automatically encoded will enable you to retrace your steps and find the backpack. Frequency. You effortlessly keep track of how many things happen, how many times things happen, as when you realize this is the third time I run into her today. Our two-track mind engages in impressively efficient information processing. As one track automatically tucks away routine details, the other track is free to focus on conscious, effortful processing. This reinforces an important principle introduced in Module 22's description of parallel processing. Mental feats such as vision, thinking, and memory may seem to be sig single abilities, but they are not. Rather, we split information into different components for separate and simultaneous processing. Okay. Um... Implicit memories involve space such as remembering the location of something. Time of such as sequences of events and frequency such as um, number of things that happen. Okay. Effortful processing and explicit memories. Automatic processing happens effortlessly. When you see words in your native language, perhaps on the side of a delivery truck, you can't help but read them and register their meaning. Learning to read wasn't automatic. You may recall working hard to pick out letters and connect them to certain sounds, but with experience and practice, your reading became automatic. Imagine now learning to read sentences in reverse. Um, effortful processing can become automatic. Well, that's easy. At first, this requires effort, but after enough practice, you would also perform this task much more automatically. 
Uh, jokes on them, I can't read anyway, <laughs> even before a word. We develop many skills in this way, driving, texting, and speaking a new language. I don't know. I think that's pretty easy to read. Although I'm a little weird. Okay, so... Um... I feel like I don't need to write much there. Okay, sensory memory. Sensory memory feeds our active working memory, recording momentary images of scenes or echoes of sounds. How much of this page could you sense and recall with less exposure than a lightning flash? In one experiment, people viewed three rows of letter, three letters each only for one twelfth of a second. After the nine letters disappeared, they could recall only about half of them. Sorry, I was looking at something. Was it because they had insufficient time to glimpse them? No, people actually could see and recall all of the letters, but only momentarily. Rather than ask them to recall all nine letters at once, researcher George Sperling sounded a high, medium, or low tone immediately after flashing the nine letters. This tone directed participants to report only the letters of the top, middle, or bottom row, respectfully. Now they rarely missed a letter, showcasing that all nine letters were momentarily available for recall. Uh, Sperling's experiment demonstrated iconic memory, a fleeting sensory memory of a visual stimuli. For a few tenths of a second, our eyes register a picture image memory of a scene, and we can recall any part of it in amazing detail, but delaying the tone signal by more than half a second causes the image to fade and memory to suffer. We also have an impeccable, thorough, fleeting, though fleeting memory for auditory stimuli called echoic, echoic memory. Picture yourself in class as your attention drifts to thoughts of the weekend. If you mildly irked teachers test you by asking, what did I just say? You can recover the last few words from your mind's echo chamber. Auditory echoes tend to linger for three or four seconds. That happens to me a lot when I'm like, when like the teacher's going too fast and I'm still writing something down, I'll just memorize what they're saying next and that, while I'm still writing. It's helpful. I'm very good at memorizing things. Um, even if I just look at it once, I can pull it back pretty quickly. I'm, like, on the cusp of, like, a photographic memory. Um, I just have to think really hard. Anyway. Did that one? Okay. Wait. What does it say about sensory memory here? Sorry. Sensory memory. Okay. Sensory memory. Memory. Is of the very brief a brief few moments after a stimulus a stimulus okay iconic memory is visual memory Echoic memory? Echoic memory? I don't know. Is auditory memory? Okay. Let's see, how many pages we Oh, like none. Okay, cool. Short term memory capacity. Recall that short-term memory refers to what we can briefly retain. The related ideas of working memory also includes our active processing. As our brain makes sense of incoming information and links it with stored memories, what are the limits of what we can hold in the middle, short-term stage? George Miller proposed that we can store about seven pieces of information, given or take two, in short-term memory. Miller's magical number seven is psychology's contribution to the list of magical sevens the seven wonders of the world the seven seas the seven daily sins the seven colors of the rainbow the seven musical skill notes the seven days of the week seven magical sevens mm. <laughs> other researchers have confirmed that we can if nothing distracts us recall about seven digits but the number varies by task we tend to remember about six letters and only about five words and how quickly do our short-term memories disappear? To find out, Lord Peterson and Margaret Peterson asked people to 
to remember three consonant groups, such as CHJ. To prevent rehearsal, the researchers asked them, for example, to start at 100 and begin counting aloud backwards by threes. After three seconds, people recalled the letters only about half the time. After 12 seconds, they seldom recalled them at all. Without the active processing that we now understand to be a part of a working memory, short-term memories have a limited life. Working memory capacity varies depending on age and other factors. Compared with children and older adults, young adults have greater working memory capacity. Having a larger working memory capacity, the ability to juggle multiple items while processing information tends to aid information retention after sleeping and creative problem solving. But whatever our age, we do better and more efficient work when focused, without distractions, one task at a time. The bottom line, it's probably a bad idea to try to watch TV, text your friends, and write a psychology paper all at the same time, with your attention switching between them. Okay. Let's see. So, short-term memory. Memory. Can only recall around seven things. Okay. Effortful processing st strategies. Several effort effortful processing strategies can boost our ability to form new memories. Later, when we try to retrieve a memory, these strategies can make the difference between success and failure. Chunking. Chunking? That's a weird word. I don't like that word. Glance for a few seconds at the first set of letters, row 1, in figure 13.7. This one? I'll do that in a second. Then look away and try to reproduce what you saw. Impossible, yes, but you can easily reproduce set 2, which is no less complex. Similarly, you will probably remember sets 4 and 6 more easily than the same elements in sets 3 and 5. As this demonstrates chulking information, organizing terms into familiar, manageable units enables us to recall it more easily. Try remembering 43 individual numbers and letters. That would be impossible. Unless chulked into, say, 7 meaningful chulks, say, try remembering, such as try remembering 43 individual numbers and letters. <laughs> chulking usually occurs so naturally that we take it for granted. I like how there's a little smiley face here, that's funny. They put emojis in this book. <laughs> Choking usually occurs so naturally that we take it for granted. If you are a native English speaker, then you can reproduce perfectly the 150 or so line segments that make up the words in the three phases of set six in figure 31.7. It would astonish someone unfamiliar with the language. We, who do not speak Chinese, are similarly awed by Chinese readers' ability to glance at figure 31.8 and then reproduce all the strokes. Even the most committed sports fan may be amazed by a varsity basketball player's recall of all the players' positions after a four-second peek at a baseball play. basketball play. We all remember information best when we can organize it into personally meaningful arrangements. Okay, I'm going to try this real quick. Oh, there we go. Wait, hello? Focus. Focus, please. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, okay. It was. Um, it was like this. Yes. Oh, that's. Wait, that's supposed to be nice. Um, and then it was. R, R, M, D. R. They almost upset it. Sorry. Okay, let's see if I can read it. Wait, one sec. Is that a V? Oh shit, it was a V, I think. Wait, was it an A? It's not focusing. It was a V, not an A. Oh. Hey, I got it exact. See, I told you guys, my memory's like freaking crazy. The only thing I got wrong was the V. It was a, not a V, it was an A. I mean, it wasn't an A, it was a V. Um, and then this one, Erkben, Gersben, I could probably remember about three of these, maybe four, what, yeah, Anyway, 
That's right. Oh my god, my camera is like freaking bugging out. It looks like I'm recording on a freaking Nokia. Can they even record on it? No, you can't. Anyway, choking. Chunking is using previously learned things to remember other things. Men, men, mnemonics, mnemonics. Self encode lengthy passages and speeches. Ancient Greek scholars and or, ordiners developed mnemonics. Mnemonics. Many of these men, memory aids use vis, vivid imagery because we are particularly good at remembering mental pictures. We more easily remember concrete, visual, visible words than we do abstract words. Try this on a friend or family member. Tell them that in another few minutes you will invite them to recall these words. Bicycle, avoid, cigarette, inherent, fire, process. Is the recall better for the three visualizable words, bicycle, cigarette, and fire? If you recall the rock-throwing rioter sentences, it's probably not only because of the meaning you encoded, but also because the sentence painted a mental image. Oh, I'm gonna... Wait, the what? If you recall the rock-throwing rioter sentence... Okay, it was, um... An angry rioter throws a rock at a window. Hopefully I'm still right. The peg word system... Oh, I'm gonna write... Um, actually, no. The peg word system harnesses our, uh, superior visual Im imagery fill. skill. This mnemonic requires you to memorize jingle. One is a bun, two is a shoot, three is a tree, four is a door, five is a hive, six is a stick, seven is heaven, eight is gate, nine is swine, ten is hen. Without much effort, you will soon be able to count by peg words instead of numbers, bun, shoe, tree, and then to visually associate the peg words with to be remembered items. Now you're ready to challenge anyone to give you a grocery list to remember. Carrots, stick them into the imaginary bun. Milk, fill the shoe with it. Paper towels, drape them over the tree branch. Think bun, shoe, tree, and you will see their associated images, carrots, milk, and paper towels. With a few errors, you will be able to recall the items in any order you, to name any given item. That's pretty cool. Okay. Oh, there's more. <clears throat> Memory whizzes understand the power of such systems. Star performing performers in the world memory championships do not usually have exceptional intelligence but rather are superior at using mnemonic strategies frustrated by his ordinary memory science writer joshua furor wanted to see how much he could improve it after a year of intense practice he won a u.s memory championship by memorizing a pack of 52 playing cards in under two minutes how did furor do it he added vivid new details to memories of a familiar place his childhood home each card represented in any order would, could then match up with the clear picture in his head. As a test subject of his own wild memory experience, he learned that you don't have to be memorizing packs of playing cards to benefit from a little bit of insight onto how your mind works. When combined, choking and mnemonic techniques can be great memory aids for unfamiliar material. Want to remember the colors of the rainbow in order of wavelength? Think of the mnemonic Roy G. Biv. Well, I just know that because I'm an art student. Um... I just think about where the colors go in relation to each other because of how they're mixed. Need to recall the names of the North America's five great lakes? Just remember Holmes, Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, Superior. In each case, we choke information, chuck, chunk information. I keep saying choke. That's a really bad word. I don't like that word. It's chunk information into a more familiar Form by creating a word called an acronym from the first letters of the to be remembered items. Okay. So, mnemonics. I. Okay, mnemonics can be used by sending a warning to be memorized. 
item with uh, something visual. Hierarchies. I'm not going to write about acronyms, but hierarchies. When people develop expertise in an area, they process information not only in chunks, but also in hierarchies, composed of a few broad concepts divided and sub subdivided into narrow narrower concepts and facts. Organizing knowledge in hierarchies helps us retrieve information efficiently, as Gordon Bauer and his colleagues demonstrated by presenting words either randomly or grouped into categories. When the words were grouped, recall was two to three times better. Such re results show the benefits of organizing what you study, of giving special attention to the module learning targets, headings, and ask yourself and test yourself questions. Taking class and text notes in outline form, a type of hierarchical organization, may also provide helpful. Okay. Hierarchies. Wow, I spelled that really wrong. Grouping information is helpful. Distributed practice. Wow, I can really see what I'm reading. There we go. We retain information better when our encoding is distributed over time. Experiments have consistently revealed the benefits of the spacing effect. Mass practice, cramming, can produce speedy short-term learning to, and a, a feeling of confidence, but to paraphrase Ebbinghaus, those who learn quickly also forget quickly. Distributed practice produces better long-term recall. After you've studied long enough to master the material, further study at the time to become in, becomes inefficient. Better to spend that extra time, extra reviewing time later, a day later if you need to remember something, 10 days hence a month or a month later if you need to remember something six months hence the spacing effect is one of psychology's most reliable findings and it extends to motor skills and online gaming pro game performance too memory researcher uh henry Do rodinger sums it up hundreds of studies have shown that distributed practice leads to more durable learning One effective way to distribute practice is repeated self-testing, a phenomenon that researchers Rajinder and Jeffrey Karpicki, Karpik have called the testing effect. Testing does more than assess learning and memory. It improves them. In this text, the testing questions interspread throughout and at the end of each module, part, and unit offer opportunities to improve learning and memory. Better to practice retrieval, any, as any exam will demand, than to merely reread material, which may lull you into a false sense of mastery. Rajinger explains two techniques that study students frequently report using for studying, highlighting or underlying text, and rereading text have been found ineffective. Happily, retrieval practice or testing is a powerful and general strategy for learning. As another memory expert explained, what we recall becomes more recallable. No wonder daily quizzing improves psychology students' course performance. Point to remember, space study and self-assessment beat cramming and rereading. Practice may not make perfect, but smart practice, occasional rehearsal with self-testing makes for lasting memories. Okay. The spacing effect is better memory when studying over a long period of time. The testing effect is better recall when testing instead of rereading to study. Okay. Levels of processing. 
Memory researchers have discovered that we process verbal information at different levels, and that depth of processing affects our long-term retention. Shallow processing encodes on an elementary level, such as a word's letters, um, letters of, or at a more intermediate level, a word's sound. Thus, we may type there when we mean there, right when when we mean right, right when we mean right, and two when we mean two. Deep processing encodes. Sys- Semantically, based on the meaning of the words, the deeper, more meaningful the processing, the better our retention. In one classic experiment, researchers Fergus Craig and Endel Tolving flashed words at viewers, then asked them questions that would elicit different levels of processing. To experience the task yourself, rapidly answer the following sample questions. Okay. Most tell. Um, is the word in capital letter- letters? Yeah. Um... Does the word rhyme with train? Yep. Um, would the word fit in this sentence? The girl put the doll on the table. Yeah. What type of processing would best prepare you to recognize the words at a later time? In Kravik and Tolving's experiment, the deeper somatic processing triggered by the third question yielded much better memory than did the shallower processing elicited by the second question or the very shallow processing elicited by the first question, which was especially ineffective. Mm. Shallow processing. Encodes at an elementary level. Deep processing. Encodes Semat- semantically based on meaning. <laughs>